welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and joining us and spending some of your precious time with us. Let's make sure I can get a screen share going. There we go. All right. It's no fun if I, it's no fun to talk about charts without showing them. It's like, yeah, it would be like watching, I, I, I paint with invisible paint in the sky, but you guys can't see me paint in the air here. So I like to, I like to have my visuals. Anyway, so want to say thank you again to you guys for joining us. We appreciate uh, you spending time with us. You know, I like to say sometimes uh, it's always nice to be in the company of people who kind of understand and appreciate your work because my wife and my family and you know some friends are just getting tired of hearing about it. So it's it's fun to geek out with you all uh, on on these numbers. Want to also say thank you. And uh, this is important. I want to say thanks to our corporate sponsors, uh, Bell Bank, North Star, RCU, and Supra. So I want to say thank you to those guys without whom, uh, you know, a lot of what we do just simply wouldn't be possible. So thanks again to Bell Bank, North Star, RCU, and Supra. You know, sometimes I pause and I just, I like to say some, some um, uh, you know, uh, words of admiration for, for North Star. Guys, when we're at conferences, back when we used to leave our houses and go to conferences and things and, and go to places that aren't our living rooms or bedrooms or kitchens, you, know, you guys would be amazed to see the, the long line of people waiting behind John Mosey and other leaders at North Star. And they're all asking him, you know, how did you do this? How did you do this merger? How did you roll out this new technology? How did you convert your platform? How did you add Paragon to your matrix offerings? Uh, so on and so forth. So we're really part of uh, e easily, and I don't just say this because we're here, uh, easily uh, the best MLS in the nation, uh, if not beyond. So um, it's always important to recognize their important work. With that, I want to give you guys a little bit of a, uh, of a lay of the land for how I want the next hour to go. Um, we're gonna start with the market. We're gonna spend, I think, most of our time in uh, section one there. Kind of broke things down into three um, subcategories, kind of short-term trends, longer-term trends, and then of course, and this is pretty important nowadays, uh, market segmentation. So having that ability to segment out the market, right? This is the notion that condos are not the same as uh, single family, new construction is not the same as uh, existing previously owned, um, Lakeville is not the same as Wyzetta, is not the same as St. Paul, is not the same as Linden Hills. It's just a way of kind of honoring that. So we're gonna do some market segmentation. Um, I wanna hop into our market reports as well. Uh, you'll see those guys are gonna be released. If they're not already on our website, they will be soon. Uh, and then I also wanna spend uh, just a few minutes talking InfoSparks as well. So don't expect a full scale training, but uh, you know, just wanna spend a, a few minutes to remind you guys how you can access some of this stuff. Uh, and of course, use it. Uh, third, uh, time permitting, um, I want to do a little bit of an economic update and, and talk a little bit about the recovery. Uh, we've had some interesting data points lately, some encouraging, some a little bit less encouraging. Of course, the big news around the, the vaccine or vaccines, um, you know, has obviously been a, a major positive. All right, the market short term trends before we even get into it. Let's talk macro, right? Before we get micro, I want to get macro. So there are three overarching trends, and this has been right. This has been a theme, you know, not just this year. Really, to varying degrees, these themes have been themes for years. Um, you know, a lot of demand, pretty weak supply, but really, it's kind of exacerbated, right? Because demand has gotten even stronger, and some sellers are, you know, uh, where am I going to go? It's still this game of musical chairs. Inventory is so low. Um, you know, I, I don't feel like I can go anywhere and have the same payment for this kind of, you know this kind of product. Um, interestingly, you know, I think maybe perhaps the role of location or the importance or the centrality of location uh, may be a little bit less important now moving forward. Is that going to change? Possibly. Uh, are 100% of the folks working from home going to go back to the office? I can 100% guarantee you that they won't. However, whether 30% go back, 50%, 70% go back, you know, that, that's obviously still a major unknown. So let's just cover these because uh, we ought to. Uh, buyer activity, remarkably strong. I've heard you guys tell me it's a, it's a feeding frenzy out there. Um, it's just, it's relentless, incessant. 
Um, those are some of the words that we're hearing you guys say. You know, uh, I want to be fair. Some of those come from maybe more, you know, urban focused agents, some from rural, uh, some from, you know, uh, maybe folks in the luxury space, others from, you know, perhaps more uh, working in the affordable segments under three or 350,000. So obviously a lot of variability there um, and your mileage may vary. So listings under contract pending sales hit their highest November level on record since 04. November closing, so actual closed deals, not just uh, accepted purchase agreements, those reached their highest level since 2003. That's all we can say with certainty, likely going all the way back to 2000. Uh, next, seller, seller activity uh, is still pretty weak. Um, overall, they're still listing fewer properties than in prior years. Even though for the month of November, we did see a one and a, a, one and a third percent bump. And then lastly, inventory. This is, uh, this is sort of the eye-popping figure. Uh, it's by far the biggest factor that's holding back sales and frustrating buyers and leading to multiple offer situations that some sellers are probably appreciating. Um, but, you know, okay, if I'm in, you know, if I get multiples on this listing, I'm pretty likely to have to go into multiples and, and possibly go over list price on the next one. So sometimes that's kind of a wash. Number of actives. Uh, listings listed under active status in RMLS down 66% from 2010, while sales and population have only increased. It's pretty remarkable, it really is. All right, let's just spend a moment briefly, and I'll be honest, we have some much more exciting visuals to share with you guys today. So let me just be brief here. I, I don't lie to you guys, here's our 1.3% increase in new listings, right? So seller activity, but check out the year to date figure, actually down seven tenths of a percent. So November, slight bump on the monthly, but on a year to date basis, uh, we actually had a, a decrease. Maybe we can call this flat, right? Plus or minus, you know, half a percent or 1% is pretty flat. What's not flat is demand, right? Pending sales up 13 and a half percent. These are our signed contracts, accepted offers, uh, so 13.5% jump there. Uh, it's about 9% on the year so far. Uh, remember though, with November data, the, the way to state the fraction is that we have 11 twelfths of the monthly data in for the year, right? 11 twelfths. I bet you don't know where that comes from. It's November being the 11th month of the year, and we only have 12 months in, in a year, most years actually. They say most people get about 12 months older each year, me, and I think all of us lately, I think we've all gotten 18 months older uh, over the last year. Anyway, so look at closed sales as well. So closed sales up 18 and a half percent. So this is interesting. Earlier on, we saw pending sales up more than closing. So that meant those contracts, you know, were somewhat slow to hit the closing table. Some of them, remember, lenders were so backed up. There was a ton. There's been refi activity. There's been new mortgage applications uh, and, and so on and so forth. What this tells, well, what this could be telling us, what this could suggest is that, you know, the major 20% plus gains in pendings have already hit the closing table. And now pendings as a leading indicator, you know, this 13% jump will likely hit the closing table. So, you know, I think that this is a little bit of a leading indicator. This 18% represents the plus 20%, right, gains in pendings, while maybe this is, you know, 13, 14, 15% representing you know, a slightly more modest gain uh, in pendings. All right, sometimes I like to geek out on these. I gotta keep moving though. Prices up 11%, sitting at about 310. Sellers in November, um, uh, this is an unbelievable figure, uh, uh, truly unbelievable. For November sellers to be getting over 100% of their list price. Uh, excuse me, uh, I should add of their original list price, not just their current list price, um, <clears throat> excuse me, after a price reduction, um, this is of their original. Remember, November is a time when, you know, things <laughs> tend to cool down. Really, you know, in terms of contracts, we usually peak it, it for contracts in May or June. We know that this summer and fall markets have behaved more like a spring market. So it's pretty remarkable to see 100% plus on November. Um, it is extraordinarily rare that we see that. In fact, we have not seen that for November. Uh, in the last 17 years, likely in the last 20 or more years. Inventory down 38%, that's totally fine because there's plenty of product uh, to write offers on. Um, incorrect, 
that is not true. There are very few uh, active listings that we can write offers on. Uh, there's 1.2 months of supply. We're aiming for five to six months. Uh, we're down 43%. Um, yes, this is a, an incredibly, incredibly low figure. Uh, we need to do better. Uh, we really have some work to do here. So let's talk about showings. I know we talked a little bit about pendings being a leading indicator for closings, but also don't forget showings are a good leading indicator of pendings, which are a good leading indicator of closings. So um, just trying to get a little bit earlier uh, in the process to you know, give ourselves a, a leg up in, in terms of what's happening down the, down the road, down the pipeline. All right, so let's be, let's be sort of brief here. Uh, 2020 here in blue, last year 2019 levels in gray. Uh, very clear to see the COVID impact, right? So as soon as we had the stay at home orders and the school closures in mid-March, uh, you guys can see what happened to showings. And of course that meant something similar happened to pendings, which of course meant something similar happened to closings. So you're taking a look at the year, uh, we were off to a pretty strong start. Um, last year, you know, I know where there were some issues with weather and, and, you know, new construction a little bit, even though it's only 10% of our market. Um, also, we had a really snowy, really wet 2019, uh, spring of 2019. So fewer people were able to get out, you know, it held some sellers back, some folks had water in their basement, so on and so forth. After this decline, you guys, where you see this big, this big delta, this big difference between uh, current levels and, and those year ago levels, once we got back on track, we easily have, have hovered, you know, we've been hovering notably above those year ago levels for showings now. So this is pretty interesting. When we got to maybe this point in time, uh, let's see, what is that? So uh, Memorial Day, 4th of July, uh, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and then the uh, end of year holidays. So, um, you know, maybe we were around here, we started to ask the question, can we make up these losses here with gains here. So we were below year ago levels for some time. And the question was, can we be above those year ago levels for enough time to compensate for these losses? And the answer is a resounding yes, right? It's an undeniable, unquestionable yes. Uh, we've had no problem uh, hovering above those year ago levels. All right, let's just read, let's just read into the tea leaves just a little bit more. Um, take a look at what happened early November. <clears throat> early November, you know, it looked like maybe these gains were going away. It looked like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, well, it didn't look like, 2020 trend was basically on top of that 2019 trend. So, you know, it, it looked like maybe these gains had passed and then November was going to be kind of consistent. And then now we have this delta again. Now we're well above. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly what caused that in November. I, I don't think it was weather. I know we had a few chilly weeks, uh, end of October, early November, but nothing, nothing too dramatic, especially for a state that's used to minus 40. Uh, so just some things to think about there. You know, it looked like perhaps we were getting back on pace with showing levels from last year. And now we're well above, once again, we're well above showing levels uh, from the year ago period. Well, look, it's no fun to look at showing activity overall. You know, it's, what, what fun is it if you can't break things out and look at activity by price point, right? By price range. So pretty similar story. Um, we've got the current week in, actually, I suppose it's a different story. I think I'm gonna recolor these. Um, <laughs> we had current year in blue, and here we have last year in blue. So apologies, I, I just realized that. I think I'm gonna recolor those. So current week is gray. Prior week is, is blue, at least I got this right. Uh, the current week is to the right uh, and the old week is, is to the left. So this is actually pretty interesting. Um, we have not seen this, uh, we have not seen this for some time. In this most affordable price segment, under 200,000, we actually saw an increase in showings and that's pretty rare because there are far fewer listings in that price category. So it's hard to have more showings on fewer listings. Right, I know what's out there is in strong demand, assuming, you know, condition and, and you know, updates and staging and, and, and all the rest. And I suppose size now that people care a lot about. Um, but, you know, it's a shrinking segment, that, that market. So it is pretty impressive to see more showings. 
you know, mostly for, for almost all of this year, we've actually seen declines here. And then we see those gains go to, you know, kind of be redistributed to these other price categories, these other segments. So it looks like our biggest gainer is three to three to 400,000. A lot of 325s, a lot of 329s, a lot of 349s in there. And a lot of new construction, again, even though it's a pretty small share of our market, it is a growing share. Um, a lot of that new construction, you know, Apple Valley, Rosemount, Lakeville, Blaine, you'll find some, you know, you'll find a lot of 350, 375 there. Um, you'll also find some six, seven, eight hundred thousand. Um, but you know, th this is a bread and butter segment in, in a lot of ways. Let's not discount million plus. I'll have a few slides today that'll show um, huh, million plus is a growth market. Uh, there's no question there. All right. Well, we all want to have our pie and eat it too. So let's talk market share. This, uh, this custard color is the pie that I have not yet eaten. This sort of tin, sort of tinny color here is uh, the slice of the pie that, that I have eaten. All right, so here's where uh, that trend I was speaking of, this is gonna become a little more clear. So look at the segment that's lost market share, right? It's showing activity on listings under 200,000. 30% of our showings used to be on those kinds, uh, on those pretty affordable listings. Now less than 23% of our showings um, uh, are on those most affordable listings. Well, you can kind of see how things look as you move up the price ladder. Um, definitely growth in million plus. Here's that segment we were talking about, uh, three to three to four hundred thousand, where you see a pretty big jump, ten and a half to almost fifteen percent of showings uh, from, you know, the current week this year versus the same week uh, last year. How about the change? Just looking at the year-over-year -year change. So this one's important, guys. I'm going to do this two ways. So here I've got. Um, well, let me just make sure. Yeah, okay, this is right. I did something right for a change. This is good. So this is, a, so this is month old data, right? This is month old data. Look at the showing activity. Look at the declines that we've seen in affordable last month, year over year. Now, current, right? So into December, now year over year, we're actually showing not dramatic, but we are showing a gain. Um, and I do think that's important. Um, you know, it could have to do with supply demand. It could have to do with maybe some folks who would be shopping or, or active in this category if they had a job loss or an income loss, if, you know, if they were impacted by COVID, maybe some of those guys are coming back online. Maybe some folks who are saving a down payment and a rental, maybe they're starting to think about come, coming out to some showings. Um, a lot of different factors uh, happening there. Let's do a very quick check of chat here. And okay, nothing to some some logistical uh, things. Okay, so this is, uh, <laughs> I hope I don't say that about all of my charts. This is one of my favorites, uh, but I probably will. So this is new listings, uh, metro-wide, using our rolling weekly average method. Um, don't, don't think too much about that, guys. We're just looking at seller activity for this year in black versus the prior three years in sort of varying shades of, I don't know, purplish blue. Uh, so, right, what we can see is, well, uh, a lot of things that we can see, um, if only we had time to talk about all the interesting things. So, look, someone says, uh, you guys always say after Super Bowl, bam, that's when spring market begins. So, uh, looks like the uh, September, Fe yeah, September, that's a month, nice. Uh, February, uh, after that Super Bowl weekend, you really see new listings spike, and then we kind of dwindle a little bit, and then enter March, beginning of March, we see that spike again. So there's definitely a little bit of you know game theory with beginning of the month versus end of the month, but you know it's also interesting that black current year seller activity was performing pretty well ahead of well I suppose here ahead of all the prior three years, but I suppose it was in second place for some time. Then enter COVID, right? So this is the BC era before COVID. This is AC after COVID. You guys can see the impact. Once things got back on track, right, it was only break even. It only got back to break even with the BC levels, those, those, those before COVID levels, right? It was still lagging well behind prior years, well behind prior years. This was encouraging. Finally, we saw this year, 2020, we saw seller activity, you know, finally uh, surpass those prior four years. It struggled to, you know, here, 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 and I suppose here it did a little bit, and then here it is again. You know, now 
it seems to be kind of, you know, synced back up. It's, it's mirroring those trends from the prior three years. So pretty interesting there. All right. Demand side, pending sales side. Um, this is a very different story, as you all know, right? You guys are experiencing this. I'm just sitting here in my office, in my home office, uh, you know, looking at numbers and making charts. You guys are out there doing business. So I know you guys sense this. So take a look at pending sales, right? At BC era, AC era. So after COVID, yes, pendings took a hit. However, they quickly and easily got back to fresh highs for the year. Remember, sellers, it took them a while to get back to those new highs for the year, right? Kind of draw this line and, you know, I don't know, maybe finally somewhere here. I don't think it was here. So finally, they got back to those new highs for the year. Buyers easily got back to those new highs. They stayed at those new highs. And this year, buyers have continued to outperform uh, the demand, uh, you know, demand indicators from prior years uh, easily, right? Maybe we're sinking back up a little bit and we talked about how, um, you know, we saw a little bit of that in the November numbers uh, for showings. So, you know, maybe that isn't interesting. Maybe showings were a leading indicator where they were November showings, right? Predicted maybe late November or early December pending sales. Kind of nice when things work out. All right. We're staying on the market, but let's shift, uh, let's pivot to some of the longer term trends. Okay, so this is November 2020, year over year. So we're comparing uh, last month to November of 2019. Seller activity, change in seller activity. Well, a couple things stand out. <laughs> this is one of them, right? So 20% gain in new listings between 250 and 350K. Um, I, I'm frankly surprised by a 5% increase in seller activity under 120,000. If I owned a property under 120,000, you probably couldn't pry it from my cold dead hands because where else am I going to go where I have a payment like that? Or maybe I own it outright, or maybe it's in a location that's close to, you know, mom, dad, aging parents, uh, you know, uh, uh, kids, what have you, uh, work back when we used to go to work and things. So um, overall, it's about a 2% gain for new listings. That is encouraging, right? It's not a big number, but it is encouraging that at least we're not down. Pending sales over on the demand side. This one sticks out to me as well. 63% increase in signed offers, accepted offers on product over a million. Again, pretty remarkable number. Um, you know, I think those jumbo rates are pretty attractive. Uh, it's not just it's not just interest rates, you know, mortgage rates for you know your average buyer that are I think what 2.7% right now. Um, jumbo rates are also benefiting. So you know, I think some of those luxury buyers are taking advantage. You know, remember also a lot of those luxury buyers were not impacted by job losses in restaurants, movie theaters, airlines, hotels, right? Um, they're they're pretty unlikely to work those positions. And so, um, you know, they, they obviously weren't nearly as impacted. They were impacted by losses in the stock market early on, but those have mostly gotten back on track. I think we're back to Dow 30,000-ish. I know up and down, depending on vaccine, are we getting good news? Is Congress going to finally get their act together and do a little COVID relief package, a second relief package? So uh, in the short term, uh, it's a, it, you know, maybe it's a, it's a little bit volatile, but worth watching and, and kind of understanding how things interplay a bit. All right, so I talked about long-term trends. Well, how about it? We, let's go back to 2003. So we can see this run up in new listings, right? Into our, into our bubble years, uh, 05, 06, you know, by 07, things had started to unravel a little bit, especially into 08. So we rode that wave down after the Great Recession, and then we kind of flatlined a little bit. I guess we've sort of trickled upwards just a hair, um, but you know, 4,000 and change, not really that impressive. I guess it's our highest since 2012. Maybe I take that back. Being at an eight year high, maybe that's not so bad, um, or close to an eight year high, maybe that's not so bad. But remember you guys, pending sales are about as high as they've ever been, right? I'll say that again, pending sales, <laughs> minus November of 04, where maybe that was a last ditch breath, you know, last breath, uh, a last ditch effort to get some of these deals done, uh, maybe before, I don't know, lending standards uh, uh, changed or uh, I don't know, before the market shifted a little bit. So we did see that run up. Maybe some builders, you know, offered discounts or offered some incentives, you know, lots of different 
lots of different possibilities there. Um, but right, we are, we are uh, at a remarkably high level uh, in terms of demand. Right, so compare that with supply, it is a completely different picture. So that's under contracts. What about closings, actual closed deals? Uh, this one is a lot easier to talk about. Uh, this is easily at a fresh, um, well, I don't know. Well, here I go, stuttering. I am almost certain this is an all time high for November, right? I'm almost positive about it. All we can say for certain is that it's since 03. That's when our data is valid as of. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost certain it's at least since 2000, very likely before. I feel pretty confident saying uh, this is a, a record for November. Uh, so a, a really a strong month. <clears throat> uh, interesting, what was going on here? You guys remember that tax credit back in 09? <laughs> Caused a nice 61% spike in uh, November sales because I think you had to go under contract initially by September. Um, so it took a month or two for those guys to hit the closing table. Interesting. Let's shift gears. Let's talk year to date. Right? Remarkable. It is unbelievable that we would. Uh, by the way, guys, this is not just November. I think it was, oh gosh, don't quote me on this. I think it was August. Yeah, September, October. I think it was August where we saw we were above for the year, right? We, we reached a new high for the year on a year to date basis. Uh, during a pandemic, during a contested election that I guess is maybe still contested, or I guess, well, I guess that depends. Well, you know what? Let's not go there. Um, <laughs> so 62,000 up 9% uh, compared to the same year to date period last year. Um, this is remarkable. Like I said, we were already there, I believe, back in August. So um, I don't think people would have predicted this. I think back in April and May, and you know, heck, even the second half of March, I bet people were saying, oh God, you know, I, I may have to dip into savings this year. I don't know if sales are gonna be good. I don't know if people are gonna be buying homes. Um, sure enough, they have in, in really remarkable numbers. All right, close sales. Uh, oops, apologies, guys. I think that's a duplicate, apologies. All right, let's take a peek at median uh, CDOM, cumulative days on market, market times. Uh, by the way, this is, um, uh, this is list to under contract, not list to close. So when it's first, uh, when it's, uh, first listed to when an accepted offer, uh, uh, to when an accepted offer, to when an offer has been accepted, pardon me, forgive me. Uh, 15 days, median, wow, right, 15 days. Half the homes took longer to sell, the other half the homes, uh, the other half of the, of the sales uh, sold in fewer days, uh, uh, sold in less time. So um, <laughs> it's a 50-50, guys. It's about a 14, 15 day, right? Two weeks. Two weeks is the median market time. Half of our homes take longer to sell, the other half take uh, uh, less time, uh, sell, sell more quickly. Quite a far cry from 115 days on market. <laughs> We are a hundred days faster, right? We've scrubbed off three months and, uh, and a week and a half or so. Uh, so really a, a big, big change. You know, we've had big changes. We've even had a 40% change, right? But you know, mostly, I mean, obviously that was a, 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 an exceptional year, but 13, 20, 13, six, you know, almost 50%, clearly something is going on here. Yeah, original list price. I think we looked at these early on just to see what kind of product was coming on. Was it skewing, you know, toward the toward the higher end sector? Was it skewing uh, toward affordable? Uh, hint, hint. We have not been skewing toward affordable lately. Um, you know, I don't know that there's a ton to write home about here. Um, just know that your your typical list price is about three hundred five, but that's only up, you know, not even two percent. Uh, earlier, it was up. Uh, it was up a lot more. So. Um, perhaps a, a little bit of a leading indicator there that prices will still be rising year over year, but maybe instead of 12% gains, perhaps we're looking at more like, you know, seven, eight, nine percent gains, which are still strong gains, but you know, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. 12% year over year, year in and year out is simply not sustainable. So June median sales price. Okay. Well, that was up 5%. August median sales price. Okay. Well, that was up 10%. November median sales price, we're now, well, now we're up 11%, right? So, you know, even though in August it was 315, 
in November it's 310, so prices have moderated a little bit, but the year over year gain, right, is still, is still very high, it's still very strong. So kind of a little bit of a peak, a little bit of a sense of what's happening with uh, year over year price gains. <clears throat> Probably an even better way to look at this and think about this is let's just plot it. Let's plot year over year change in median sales price. Uh, what do we have happening back here? Right, we have the meltdown, right? We have the uh, foreclosure crisis, the mortgage crisis, and the Great Recession, uh, where prices were, you know, uh, maybe not in free fall, but they were down pretty significantly. We had a little bit of stabilization, again, during that tax credit period, and then we had to find our footing, right? We had to find bottom, find our floor. Once we did, we saw investors swoon in and do a lot of flips, right? We saw flippers coming in and, you know, scooping up good product at, at pretty good deals and then turning it over and, hey, you know, America, right? That's, that's, that's the freedoms we enjoy. So prices up 18% during that period. And then we kind of moderated a little bit. A um, couple periods of, you know, 10, 12% plus growth. Um, we are now back there, right? You guys can see, look at this clustering here. Uh, so what is this? Uh, June, July, August, September, uh, sorry, July, August, uh, September, October, November, right? So previous five months or so have been, you know, at or above, uh, I should say near or above 10%. So, you know, this chart kind of tells us that, you know, price growth is stronger than it has been, you know, here, maybe not technically here, but here, um, Reminds me of Chris Farley in that movie, kind of here, not so much here, a little bit more like here. Anyway, yes, uh, it's not a new record. Uh, however, <clears throat> it is obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, price growth has obviously accelerated a little bit. Sometimes we get questions on this, guys. What is the difference between median and average? I'm so glad you asked. We have a joke about this. Jeff Bezos walks into a bar, right? The way all good jokes start. A couple people sitting in the bar, right? One's making 40 a year, 50, 55, 65. One's earning 90K a year and the other earning one and a quarter, okay? In walks Mr. Bezos with his 200 million a year uh, compensation package, some in uh, incentive bonus pay, some in baseline comp, some in stock options, but hey, 200 million is 200 million, right? So he walks into a bar and look what happens to the average income. The average income is $28.6 million. Huh, that's a lot of money. I don't think these people are gonna identify much with a $28 million a year income, right? So check out the median. The median is $65,000 a year, why? Because three made more than that 65, and three made less than that 65. The median, quite simply, is that midpoint. It's in the middle, half above, half below. Let's make this a little more interesting. Same six patrons at the bar, back when they used to go to bars. Um, by the way, uh, I know some are open and some are skirting the law, and I would encourage you not to go there. So here in walks Jeff Bezos. This time, my friends, he's making 200 billion a year. You know, I'm not sure, maybe this is closer to accurate. I guess I didn't look it up in, on the Forbes list, uh, but maybe this is closer to reality. So now the average income, instead of 28.6 million, you got it, now it's 28.6 billion with a B. But this is the glory of a median. This is what's so amazing about median. The median income didn't move a penny, didn't have to. It's still in the middle. Half were making less, half were making more. The median does not care how much more Bezos is making, right? It's irrelevant. He's just one more data point above this median. I don't care if it's 200,000, 200 million, or 200 billion. Um, that's why I think median is a better measure, right, of typical incomes, typical home prices, you know, what, what have you. So, all right, now I'm kind of beating the dead horse over the head. So let's just finish this up quickly. <laughs> So let's, let's think about five houses now. All right, well, these are your five houses, right? 150, two and a quarter, 275, 350, half a mil, and then a $3.5 million home. You know, it's the same exercise. Average sales price, 833,000. 
right? I don't think some of these guys are gonna identify much with that, with that price point. The median sales price, and this is a little bit different because we've got an even number, right? Here we've got six. So we've got to split, um, right, three and four down the middle, and that's 312.5. That's the midpoint where half sold for less, half sold for more. All right, you get it. One out of five or only 20% are above average versus 50% above and below the median. Okay, let's just spend 10 seconds on PPSF price per square foot. You guys can see peak of the bubble, 140 per foot. Now $22 per square foot more uh, at 162 per square foot. This is quite simply um, uh, sales price divided by TFSF, total finished square footage. So how many dollars are you paying per finished square foot? You know, uh, maybe not a, 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 the same story, but a similar story, a similar way to think about this. Okay, a $200,000 home for 2,000, right? A $200,000 price tag for 2,000 square feet, 100 bucks a foot. A $400,000 price tag for 4,000 square feet, huh, still 100 bucks a foot. So even though our price doubled, so did our square footage, which meant we really didn't spend any more per square foot of house. Obviously, there are other factors, right? Layout, neighborhood, school district, right? Uh, remodel, um, you know, master suite, you know, kitchens. Yes, it all matters. Um, walkouts, is it a walkout underground or do you walk out to water? You know, uh, uh, the list goes on and on. But just a way of thinking about, you know, the price tag isn't always apples to apples, right? What price per square foot brings into play is, you know, listen, yes, the price is twice as high on home B, but because you get twice as much, it's actually identical on a per square foot basis. I know some of you love this. I know others hate it. Um, it is not a magic bullet. It is not an end all be all. It is just one more tool in your toolbox, you know, that you're empowered with that you can arm yourself with to have you know, enlightened conversations about the market of, uh, with clients. So November percentage of original list price, huh? There's our 100.2% up 2.7%. You guys can see we had been kind of bouncing around that 97 and a third, 97 and a half mark uh, for three years. Uh, as the song goes, there's clearly, there's something happening here, right? Over 100%, really remarkable well, well, well above bubble levels uh, and quite a long cry, quite, quite a far cry from the 90% of original list price that sellers were accepting back in 2010. Quick time check. Oh my gosh, 240. I got to keep going. Okay, November actives, right? Down from 33,000 to under 7,000. Like we said, this is probably the biggest factor that's impacting the market. We just don't have enough supply. That's clear any way you slice and dice it. Um, virtually any market, um, vir well, maybe I shouldn't say uh, almost every price point. You know, obviously, under 300K is a lot more is a, has a lot more slim uh, supply. Uh, supply is a lot thinner down there than it is over 750, over a million, uh, and up. You know, that leaves us with 1.2 months of supply. Right, barely over a month of supply. Um, pretty long shot from our nine and a third, nine and a half months of supply. Uh, so again, a, a, a dramatically undersupplied market. You know, we're aiming for a balanced market with about five to six months supply of inventory, but we're now in a seller's market where we have all these buyers competing for a limited supply of homes, right? Versus a buyer's market like we had in 2010, 11, and 12. Uh, and around that time, where actually you only had two buyers for these six active listings, meaning what? these sellers have to compete with one another to lure in these buyers. Here, these buyers have to compete with one another to you know, make their offers the most attractive to this seller, right? So if this guy is saying, look, my inspector found that you know, there was a little crack in uh, you know, a piece of the vinyl siding, so I'd like you to replace it. You know, this guy is gonna say, listen, not only do I not care about that, I'm not even gonna do an, ins an inspection and I'm gonna pay you 100% in cash, right? Now, we're not advising anyone to bypass inspections, but we're just saying that that is, that is a, a factor in this market. That is one feature in this market, right? 
for better or for worse, um, you know, you have a lot of competition here among buyers. All right, year to date. So we talked about year to date numbers are pretty locked in. Um, I think we covered a few of them. So let's just run through a few others. So year to date new listings, you guys, we are not up in terms of seller activity on a year to date basis. We saw we are still lower. We've actually been trickling lower um, for some time, I suppose last year, uh, last November year to date, a little bit of an interruption up two tenths of a percent, right? But you, know, you see mostly minus signs, um, which is, which is not what we need, right? We need more listings. We need more product. Pendings year to date, right? There we go. We're well above. Uh, you guys can see that. Closed sales also well above 59,180, uh, well above uh, bubble levels. So CDOM, we're not quite 15 uh, on the year to date basis. We're about 18, uh, about 18 days on market. And you guys can see how that compares with prior years. Uh, sales price so far this year, we're about 305. I think November was 310, up 11%. So far for the year, we're 305, up 9%. But even that 9%, let's see, all right, six, eight, six and a half, five and a half, seven, uh, eight. All right, so I guess we have to go back to 2013 when we had a 14.5% jump. Um, but that was off of pretty low levels, right? Baseline matters. That was off of uh, pretty, pretty suppressed uh, baseline levels. All right, so I know we've had a lot of 100% plus, um, you know, uh, months on that ratio of uh, sold to original list price. You know, I don't think we're gonna, climb, well, we're not gonna climb over 100% for an annualized basis on, an, on, a, on a yearly basis, but golly, 99.8% is really a remarkable figure, um, you know, for the year to date period. All right, let's talk just some affordability very briefly. We're gonna take some deep dives here with our Affordability canines, uh, Scuba Sam and Scuba Steve, uh, gender neutral. So affordability concerns, do we have them? I mean, I think so. I think consumers, agents, right, the media, um, you know, I think people believe we have affordability challenges and I believe that they're right. However, can't remember who told me this, but someone said, you know, David, if you're ever feeling down on yourself or down on your luck, just compare your life to someone else's, you know, who has it worse than you. Well, you know, I, I don't always like doing that, um, mostly because I feel bad and guilty, but it is worth remembering. Let's look at some of these other regions that we, you know, maybe compete with for talent, uh, for, for, for corporate relocations, for, you know, inbound migration, for housing dollars, for transportation dollars. Um, right, so look at this. Our median income is just over 100,000 for 2020. Uh, by the way, that is uh, MFI, so median family income, typical family, right? Half, or, half the families are earning over 103, the other half under 103. Uh, so let's look in San Francisco. Okay, well, they're making 143, the typical family. Okay, so what are they earning? 40% more than us? that would mean that their home prices could be 40% higher than us and still have that same affordability, right? <laughs> their median price is over $1.6 million. And this is, I think, a year, even a year old or about a year old. So, right, 300,000 for us to double that for San Fran would be 600,000. And because prices just went 100% higher and incomes are only 40% higher, Doubling would mean a lot less affordable. Instead, right? What are they, what are they up sixfold? Uh, you know, six times uh, from um, uh, excuse me, five times from from three hundred thousand to one point five million. So uh, pretty remarkable there. And, and when you compare us with other cities on this price to income basis, right? We're about three. Other cities, other regions are are you know have a far worse affordability picture than we do. That said, that doesn't mean we don't have an affordability challenge or a squeeze, as I call it here. Some of it is relative to ourselves and our own past, right? Not necessarily always relative to other regions. This looks at the percentage of listings that are under a quarter million. You know, let's focus on the metro. Um, so heading into the bubble, 62%. At the peak of the bubble, obviously lower, right? Closer to 50%. As prices came down, then we saw 70% of our listings were under that 250 mark. Look at where we've gotten now. 
only 23.5% of our actives are under 250,000. Our friends in St. Paul doing a better job, right? 53%. Minneapolis, 30%, right? So big difference between the two cities. Um, you know, and no one should be po should, no one should be picking on St. Paul for this. This is a good thing. Um, it's a good thing. It's it's what people want, right? That's a that's a price point that a lot of people want to be under, and they're finding that it's so hard to be under that. Um, so I do think we have work to do. And you look at a lot of liter the literature on workforce housing, affordable housing, the missing middle, um, and there's a lot of literature that supports the need for that. All right, this is our long-term view, um, very long-term view. We're actually going all the way back to 1960. Back in the days where North Star used to mail out these little, little mailers, of course, you know, the internet wasn't a thing. And they'd mail out these little mailers, these little booklets, and uh, believe it or not, we archive those. And I get the privilege to mine through them with a inkwell and quill and a um, tobacco pipe and maybe one of those Sherlock Holmes hats um, with, the, with the bills on both sides. You know, I get to mine through that and say, hey, let's trend this over time. Let's see if we can see anything from this. Is there anything to be, to be gained, anything to learn here? Well, as always, yes, there's always something to learn. So look at our bubble, you guys. Blue is our actual reported sales prices. Right? These are our reported sales prices. You guys can see the bubble. Sure enough, that lines up perfectly with 2006. You guys can also see the hangover after the bubble. Right? Uh, here is our party, here is the hangover. Here's what's interesting though. The average, if you actually go back to 1960, the average rate of growth, rate of price appreciation in nominal terms is about 5.5%. Right? So 5.4. So what I've done is I've taken that I've gone one tenth percent below and one tenth of a percent above. And that's what these red and, I think it's khaki colored, that's what these red and sort of grayish uh, dotted trend lines are. This is the range if we were kind of, you know, plus or minus that 5.4%. This is the range we'd be in. Well, looks like we were a little bit below that range, then above, and then we got close, then we were way above, then we were below. Believe it or not, we're actually not even yet back in that range. What does that mean? Well, here, right, this was an unsustainable rate of growth, right? And, and this is the result of that. We were so far outside these channels, these kind of historical channels, um, that when the, when the planet gets so far away from that center of gravity, it has to come back, right? It comes back to, to, that, to that center of gravity. And sure enough, that's exactly what we saw. The other thing this means is that technically, Technically, we do have some room to run here. You know, we get asked a lot, are we in a bubble? You know, uh, uh, you know prices are going to come down in the coming years, right? Well, possibly, depending on rates, the economy, <laughs> the pandemic, um, you know, what happens with builders and sellers and, and so on. Uh, you know, but we're still below this channel. And I think that's pretty interesting. So don't forget about that. All right, back to the market. We're gonna do a little bit on market segmentation here. I'm gonna to have to go a little bit fast. Um, oops, you guys, forgive me. This is not the Twin Cities. The Twin Cities has far more. This is just Minneapolis, as you might guess from uh, Calhoun Square, or is that Bede Makaska Square now? I don't know if they've changed that. So November new listings, this is just in Minneapolis. So 476, all right, looks like we have to go back to what, 2010 to see those levels? How about, again, not Twin Cities, but Minneapolis, forgive me, Minneapolis pending sales, 468, huh? Well, for that, we have to go all the way back to 2004 to see those levels. So do you mean to tell me that Minneapolis new listings are at their highest level since 09, but Minneapolis pending sales are at their highest level since 2004? I think most people would be surprised by that. Um, but that's the beauty of facts and science and data. You don't have to agree with it for it to be true. All right, November percentage of original list price. So uh, here again, guys, again, apologies. Um, I'm gonna fix this right away for next time. I feel bad. Um, this is Minneapolis. Um, that's that nice little condo tower, uh, right? Uh, let's see, right to the uh, east of Bede Makaska, right on, uh, off of Lagoon. So, uh, right, again, in the city, 98.8%, you know, stands to reason if people were fleeing the city as some claim, uh, even though we see that buyer activity, right, has a stronger record than seller activity, 
know, stands a reason that homes wouldn't be selling in near record time at record strong offers. Okay, percent of original list price. Now we're gonna break things down, break things down by single family, condo, and townhome. Looks to me like single family and townhome sellers are getting pretty strong offers, right? Flat at 100%. What's going on with condos? A little bit of a different story here, right? Condos, um, sellers are having to accept a slightly lesser share of their list price, of their asking price. Something else interesting here, and again, I think people would be surprised by this, but that doesn't make it not true, right? So actually we saw the condo market softening starting a year ago. It's actually August of last year, over a year ago. We saw that sellers were getting a slightly lesser share. I should say sellers were accepting a slightly lesser share of their list price. So some people like to look at this and say, oh gosh, April, 2020, that was the year, you know, where things started to unravel for condos. Well. I mean, I suppose they continued to decline a little bit, but that wasn't really a new trend. Perhaps in some ways COVID may have exacerbated it, but it did not start that trend. And again, facts matter. All right, so the quick peek back, that was median, this is average. Here's what's interesting. So condos, again, um, you know, trickling a little bit downwards, but look at single family and uh, townhomes when we look at average. So the median says, right, 100%, meaning half we're getting over 100%, half we're getting less. The average really answers the question, of those half that we're getting, right, uh, uh, of those half, how many, uh, how much more or how much less is the way to think about that. And look at the movement that we've seen, right? So yeah, uh, you've seen a lot of movement here, you know, more than we've seen in a long time which speaks to the desirability of townhomes and single family, um, you know, a little bit more so than uh, for condos. Guys, lots of things going on with condos, um, health concerns. How about just there's no Vikes and Twins games and there's just no dining and nightlife on First Ave and Hennepin and Nicollet. And, you know, people, you know, uh, downtown workers, they have less of an incentive to buy a downtown condo because they don't work at their office anymore, right? How many, you know, what percentage of, the downtown workforce is working from home. Um, it is a majority. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of different factors here. How about health reasons? Sharing a elevator button and a doorknob in a business center with, you know, you know other folks, maybe you're high risk. You know, a lot of different factors here. Public safety uh, issues in some parts. So a lot of different factors here. So interestingly, pending sales in November. Okay, so up 15% for single family also about 15% for townhome, you know, condos lagging a little bit, but still up 10%, only from 257 to about 283. New construction, all right, November sales, 30% uh, surge on new construction signed contracts, 13% for previously owned, but again, look at the numbers, right? So uh, 4,100 versus 5,500. I suppose for November, it looks like they were maybe a little bit more than uh, 10 percent but not much maybe 11 or 12. pending sales all right it's almost all traditional you know we don't have to go too in depth on this foreclosures down short sales down i'm only bringing this back in because as foreclosure or uh, excuse me uh no that's right as foreclosure and eviction moratoria start to expire this is something that we want to monitor so we'll be looking at distressed activity both on the new listing side and on the pending uh, under contract side. So um, nothing to write home about yet, but we're gonna keep watching it. All right, pending sales broken down by price point. So uh, under 250, 250 to up to half a mil, half a mil up to a mil, and then 1 million or uh, higher. Pending sales, you can see our bread and butter segment, this 250 to 400, uh, excuse me, 250 to 500. You know, remember guys, a lot of this is in that maybe three to 350 range, um, as we actually saw with some of our other charts. So bread and butter segment here, a lot of activity. All right, 26% gain, a little bit of a decline in affordable, 21%, wow, 70%, right? That's pretty strong. It's not a big share of the market, but it did experience significant growth. I promise you, we talk about this and this is, Another embarrassment, uh, <laughs> November is supposed to be up here, uh, forgive me. So closed sales over a million, you guys. Take a look at this. 
72%, 71% gain, uh, well above uh, 04, 05, 06 levels. How about year to date? Let's take a look on a year to date basis. Still a 20, about 21% gain, 920 of these versus not even 500 uh, at the peak of the, of the 05, 06 bubble. So um, luxury housing in the metro really appears to be on a tear. Again, jumbo rates, and again, those buyers were not nearly as impacted as a lot of the other folks uh, you know, in the economy. So size matters, you guys. Let's just talk very briefly. Um, smaller homes under 1,500 square feet, all the way up to your big stuff, over 2,500 square. Um, maybe 2,500 isn't that big, but you know, as you get to 35 and 4,000 and 5,000, you're starting to get a little bit on the big side. So take a look at this. Yeah, that was actually our biggest gain, our 46% increase in under contracts, um, you know, versus 30, 30, and 13. Oh gosh, excuse me, you guys. I need to point this out. This was for September. Look at November. For November, um, you know, we still see, I guess, the second biggest gain, but actually, oddly enough, again, this came as a surprise to me um, to see technically the biggest gain being some of this more affordable. Uh, uh, well, smaller and more affordable product. Um, very briefly, we're going to have some bedroom talk here. Um, September pending sales, one bed or fewer, all the way up to four beds plus, right? So the bulk of it, the bulk of our sales are four bed, um, I guess more than any other segment, right? That was a 42% gain versus not even 30, right? Eight and 11. So definitely a lot of demand over there, right? This kind of confirms that. Ah, huh, shoot, you guys, I did it again. That was September. This is November. I, I keep tricking myself, myself, myself. Sometimes there's more than one. So 16%, right? We still see that as the, uh, as the biggest gainer, right? That bigger, the bigger product with more, more beds. Um, but, you know, we did see some gains uh, that weren't that far away, uh, I suppose, as well. All right, I think we're going to be a tad shy on time to go through um, all of our InfoSpark stuff. But I did want to do, I did want to just show you guys, just so you're aware, you know, most of you know, um, right from our homepage, just click on um, either the market data section or this today in the market section. You'll get right into fast stats where you guys can look at our locals, right? The weeklies, the monthlies, and in about a month, maybe a month and a week or so, I, I'll be very proud to share our annual report, one of my favorite reports, very in depth. I also just want to say, you guys, you know, interest rates I just saw in my inbox today, check this out, 9.13 a.m. this morning from Housing, uh, housing Wire, um, mortgage rates hit another record low, right? 2.67%. And sure enough, here we are in, in our system. Uh, and it's been a, a really remarkable, a uh, really remarkable thing. Uh, also, just briefly, let's talk unemployment rate. Check this out. October's our most recent data unemployment rate. Salt Lake City, number one, who's number two? You're sitting in it, right? Well, likely sitting in it. Minneapolis, St. Paul Metro, the second lowest unemployment rate of any major metro area with over a million residents, right? So, you know, I, I find that to be pretty encouraging. You know, I don't think it means we're out of the woods necessarily, but we are outperforming many other regions. Um, by the way, uh, high performing regions, right? Seattle, uh, uh, Raleigh, um, you know, Atlanta, um, yeah, you know, a lot of other pretty high performing regions. I want to also mention lastly, this is important, you guys, and we're seeing this. We talked a lot about the shape of this recovery, right? Is it going to be a swoosh, a U, a W, a V? I, I <laughs> zero percent of economists thought it was going to be a V and they were correct. Really what we're seeing, and really this is actually unfortunate. What we're seeing is a K-shaped recovery, right? The economy came down. Professionals have mostly recovered. Everyone else kind of has yet to be made whole, has yet to get back to, you know, these levels. So there's a little bit of a K-shape going on. This is what people mean when they talk about a K-shape uh, recovery. So here's your BC, your prior to COVID era, right? And then here's that, that brief recession. And then there's your K, there's your divergence. So tech, you know, retail, software, obviously outperforming travel, entertainment hospitality, um, and, and food services. So just so you guys know, I, I just want to mention that, that people talk about that a lot, and that is one of the things that they mean. 
And just in my final 30 seconds here, I know I'm pushing it. I just want to make sure everyone knows, I think I saw some new folks today. When you're logged into Northstar, into Matrix here, you'll see under tools, you'll see InfoSparks, right? Most of you know this, but just in case, when you look at InfoSparks, you're going to see the tool. The way I think about it is metrics at the bottom, right? Breakouts or market segments up top, and then areas in your area box. So I can basically combine any area with any metric, right? With any market segment. So now I'm just looking at new construction prices, but now I wanna look at single family absorption rates, right? It's gotta think for one second, but there you have it, 1.8 months of supply. Now I wanna see days on market for 2,500 square foot or bigger single family homes, 28. What if I wanna see that just for Richfield? Well, there aren't a lot of bigger properties in Richfield, so um, right, looks like about 24 days on market. So there you have it. And how does that compare with, oh gosh, should we have some fun, Boisetta? 94 days versus 24 days, right? So uh, uh, a nice uh, 70 day difference there. So I just hope that gives you guys a little bit of a peek of how to think about it and you know how to share it. And if you guys have any questions, please reach out. I, I encourage you guys to use that tool. It is by far the most powerful tool that we've ever produced for uh, market analytics. And with that, I should stop in the name of love and see if there are any questions uh, left for those of you that chose to stuck around, uh, stick around with us three minutes over time. Um, I do wanna say thank you to you guys uh, for sticking around. Let's take a look in chat. Is it okay to share some of these slides? Richard, it is absolutely okay. Yeah, I know some of you guys will do screenshots, um, but um, we'll get this distributed. Uh, you know, shoot me an email and I can send you the slide, you know, whatever you guys need. Happy to, absolutely happy to share. Let's look at one more. Like, yeah, what do we have, Lisa? So CDOM, uh, yes, so I think we answered this. Is CDOM from list date to the date it goes pending or the date it is marked active contingent? Ooh, gosh, that's a good question. Ooh, Lisa, you got me thinking on that one. Is CDOM from list date it goes pending? So A comma I is still technically under active status. So that's not technically an under contract until it actually goes into um, under contract appending status, um, I I'm 99% sure that's when that clock, that days on market clock stops. I'm gonna make a note, I'm gonna follow up with you. I'm gonna get a, a for sure answer on that, but I'm 99%. Uh, okay, so uh, one other one, will very low interest rates continue to keep inventory low? Um, so, you know, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has signaled to markets, capital markets, equity markets, um, that that you know it is the Fed's intention to maintain an accommodative stance, you know, when it comes to monetary policy. So that's fancy talk. That's Fed speak <laughs> for saying you know we expect rates to remain low for some time. Um, you know, in ten years from now, I don't expect rates to be under three percent, but in a year or two, you know, I would expect them to at least still be under four percent, maybe not under three. Um, so I think the thing about these low rates is that it, they act as an incentive, right? I want to capture them, right? I have FOMO. I have a fear of missing out. My friends are buying homes. Rates are good. I don't want to miss out on these rates. So I want to reach out and grab that carrot that is being dangled in front of me. So, you know, yes, I think that as rates are low and that incentivizes, you know, that inventory to be gobbled up by buyers. And by the way, we have renters leaving. Um, there's some evidence that uh, rents are lowering a little bit and rental vacancies are up a little bit, depending on area, depending on luxury rentals or not, uh, depending on single family rental versus multi. So yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that low inventory is going to keep buyers super active. Some sellers will be, you know, there, there will be some move up buyers, um, but that's, you know, that's what we really need more of. We need someone to sell their $350,000 home go buy a $500 or $600,000 home and then free up that more, perhaps more entry level product. You know, whether we manage to do that in the coming years, I guess is anyone's guess, I'm not incredibly confident just because of where things stand. Um, yeah, I, I do have some concerns about that. So yes, um, 
Uh, I do think that low interest rates are going to continue to pressure inventory unless we can move the needle on, on building permits and new construction. You know, one of, the, one of the good ways to alleviate the supply crunch was to, quite simply, maybe we look at building 200 units on a half acre instead of one unit on a half acre. But condos in some ways, you know, are experiencing, you know, some challenges, you know, based on what we, we spoke of not that long ago. So maybe that doesn't make as much sense. The market isn't as strong for that. It doesn't demand that product as much. So we're gonna have to get creative folks. You know, I don't know if it's more, you know, instead of vertical condos, maybe it's horizontal, you know, townhomes, you know, probably with a shared common wall to get some of that density, you know, separate entrances, you know, not really any shared spaces, um, but to have that density to be able to, to, to fit more units into that, you know, uh, quarter acre, half acre, you know, 10 acre parcel, whatever it is. So yeah, I do think we're going to have work to do. Uh, what is the outlook for foreclosures if we do not get extensions? Oh, Dan, that is the million dollar question. I mean, I would, I would imagine it wouldn't be a good thing, <laughs> right? You know, if we, if we can't somehow, you know, prevent the bleeding, you know, I would expect a little bit of an increase. Now, that's not to say that we're gonna be due for a 2008 all over again. I think that's the key. That's the difference. People look at this and they say, oh my God, we're headed for 2008. I better go dig a hole in the sand to bury, you know, to, to, to live under uh, because it's gonna be just scorched earth for the next, you know, how long? It, it, it's just not the case, right? The last bubble, it was a supply driven bubble. Now we have so much demand and we're undersupplied. Um, so, you know, is it possible that we have an increase in foreclosures? Yes, it, it definitely is, depending on what happens. You know, is, if I can delay payments, so let's say I, I take a forbearance on four months, five months of payments, you know, in month six, do all of those previous five months come due in addition to my December payment? Because that's gonna be pretty hard to bear. If we can get, you know, creative with, you know, a, a, a portional payment and, and you know, somehow amortize that in somehow, you know, I, I, I think again, we're going to have to get creative. Let me say this, let me, let me finish answering that question or finish rambling on that question by saying this. If we do see an increase in foreclosure listings, the reason I'm not really, um, you know, afraid of that or, or as I should say, as concerned about that as I was in 20, you know, uh, 08, 9, 10 and 11, is because our market is in such a different place and such a more undersupplied place that I think so many of those, uh, so much of that product would get bought up, whether it's investors, flippers, people looking to convert to rentals, um, which obviously has upsides and downsides for us, um, you know, or, or just, you know, a, a, a brave homeowners looking to uh, take on a, a project. Um, you know, they've been watching a lot of HGTV and they're feeling ready. So, even if we were to see an increase, I think they would get bought up so quickly that they wouldn't linger. And I don't think they would become comps as readily for, you know, others, you know, looking to, looking to sell. I just don't think it would bring back, bring back, bring down the market like it did, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, uh, looks like Marzina has one more follow-up. Uh, homeowners are sitting on a lot of equity to give up their homes easily. Yes, uh, absolutely, um, 100%, I should have mentioned that. Um, we are in such a different picture now in terms of home equity. I think the figure is um, homeowners in 2008 took out $80 billion in uh, home equity lines of credit and HELOCs. Now, even while prices are much higher than that than they were in 08, uh, they're only taking out, I think it's 20 billion, so a quarter as much equity you know, extracted from our, from our homes. So in other words, you know, we're not treating them like ATMs. We're letting that equity sit. And I think what Marzina is accurately, you know, hinting at is, you know, even if my, even if my value were to go down 10%, okay, so my $300,000 home, maybe now it's worth 270 or 280. Well, guess what? I bought it at 225. I can stomach that. I've got some cushion, uh, you know, to, to, to cushion any, you know, any fall. So, you're not gonna see the, the walkaways, you're not gonna see the defaults, you're not gonna see the fire spread uh, uh, like it did. You also don't have 517101 adjustable arms with these you know, ballooning uh, rates and payments. So 
again, just a different picture. You don't have uh, no doc loans, no income, no doc loans. It's such a different picture. Um, yeah, and I, I thank you, Marcina, for bringing that up. All right, guys, we are 10 minutes over. Uh, I, I wanna be respectful of time, but hey, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk for another five minutes if there's anything further. Let's see, seeing none, shall we wrap up? Oh, let's check chat real quick. I checked Q&A. All right, seems like people are mostly happy. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions come in, but just a reminder, we will put the recording from today on our website. We'll also email that and the presentation slides out to everybody who was registered. So you can expect that in the next day or so. Awesome, thank you so much, Ann. And I also wanna say thanks to our uh, to our sponsors again, I, I want to put that slide up once again uh, for our annual sponsors. So thanks again to Bell Bank, North Star, uh, RCU, and Supra. Please come back in January, you guys. It'll be it'll be fun. We'll have some annual numbers, uh, and we'll kind of uh, set the stage for the year. And I think it'll be good. So thanks again so much for joining us, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you.